Hello, good evening and welcome. I'm Gretchen Dietrich. I'm the Executive Director of the Utah Museum of Fine Arts and it's my pleasure out there. I don't actually see you right now. And to welcome you to our program this evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Before we begin, I would like to remind us all that the University of Utah and the UMFA acknowledges that we are on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Ute, Goshute, Paiute, and Northwestern Shoshone peoples. It is our responsibility significance of place, continued existence, and the contributions of indigenous people who have lived on and cared for this land for thousands of years. We respect the sovereign relationships between tribes, states, and the University of Utah's and the UMFA's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. I also feel compelled to say once again that we strive for the UMFA to be a safe space for all people and a place where we value and a culture of care for one another and for our community. I especially send love and support to our art lovers, members, docents, and staff who identify as Asian American and Pacific Islander people. I know that recent incidents of, in, uh, of increases in incidents of violence towards the a API community has made this a very challenging time. And I want to be clear that we support our AAPI community. We're here for you and that will never change. Again, it's my thrill to welcome you tonight to this wonderful program. We miss you, our UMFA art lovers, um, but we're so glad you're here for this behind the scenes view of our new Arts of Japan gallery. We're really happy that you're able to be here tonight for this special presentation with Luke Kelly, our esteemed and so wonderful Associate Curator of Collections and Antiquities, live on YouTube. In the coming weeks, the UMFA will transform one of our top floor gallery spaces into a new Arts of Japan gallery, a space dedicated solely to exhibiting the art and visual culture of Japan. With unique objects from various eras of Japan's long history, the UMFA's collection of Japanese art is among our most popular, and we're really thrilled to give it permanent space on view for everyone in our community to enjoy. These works are such treasures, and this new gallery is a welcome and exciting addition to the museum. At the end of Luke's presentation, there will be a brief Q&A moderated by our friend Hillary. So if you have any questions, make sure that you type those into the YouTube chat and we'll answer as many as we can get to at the end of tonight's program. Now, I also wish to thank some amazing people whose commitment to Japanese art at the museum this gallery space possible and will also help it continue to grow. The Joseph and Evelyn Rosenblatt Enrichment Fund and the collectors Rich Hillegas and William Bill Traeger. Thank you so much for making this possible for all of us. I want to acknowledge and thank the staff and board of the UMFA, an amazing group of art loving humans who have worked so hard during such a wild and crazy time to ensure that the UMFA not only survives, but that we actually thrive during this time. The museum is doing well, creating rich, timely and relevant programming for a variety of audiences, and we're in good shape financially too, which is also very important. We're basking in the glory of the recently departed Black Refractions exhibition from the Studio Museum in Harlem, and we are doing great work and looking forward to bringing so many important and exciting artists and projects to Salt Lake in the coming months and years. Finally, a big thank you to all of you. I'm hearing from my art museum director colleagues in many communities across the country that their membership roles have actually decreased in the last year and ours at the UMFA have actually grown. So you are wonderful, generous and dedicated members. You love and value our museum as much as we the staff do. And for that, we simply cannot thank you enough. We send you our very best wishes. Stay well and stay safe and come and see us soon in the museum's galleries. So with that, I will turn it over to our my wonderful colleague, Luke. Thanks, Luke, for preparing this for us. And also a big shout out to Derek Wall and to Hilary Hahn in our development department for helping to organize tonight's event. So thanks everyone, enjoy the program. It's all yours, Luke. Welcome everybody. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. Tonight, you're going to be the first people outside of the museum to learn about the new Art of Japan Gallery that's going to open May 26. So it's just around the corner. I hope as everyone's getting vaccinated or is already vaccinated and some are coming, 
that in the coming months I can actually give tours of this new gallery in person. Uh, I'm looking very forward to that. But without further ado, I wanted to go, I wanted to give a brief overview tonight of what I'm going to cover. This is a chance to do, to go beyond the layouts and checklists, to do a deeper dive into the, gal into the objects and how they illustrate the theme, gallery theme of adaptation and transformation in these objects. Our articulated raptor, the set of samurai armor, our katana and wakazashi swords, as well as Hiroshige's view of 60 odd provinces. But at the end, because you're art lovers and I wanted to give you a sneak peek, what will be coming in 2022 because we will be regularly rotating our woodblock print collection and you'll be, able, you'll be the first ones to see what will be coming on view in 2022. So without any ado, let's get the show started. What you see here is mock-ups that our brilliant exhibition designer, Sarah Palmer, created in January, 2021. And you can see the objects that will be included in the show include some woodblock prints, the articulated raptor, the Buddha, as well as the empty case you see is for the samurai armor, as well as the sword blades. So where is it? Well, it is upstairs and it's taking over one of the European galleries, one of the six European galleries. Now, I already hear the questions. Uh, what's going to happen? Does this impact the European galleries? And does, what's going to happen to the art objects, the paintings that are currently on display in the gallery? Well, former curator Leslie Anderson, in designing the layouts for the galleries, had picked the gallery that will become Art of Japan as a rotating European art gallery, where she was going to rotate and look at discrete themes in European art history, independent of the five other galleries on view. Uh, so this will not impact the European uh, installation that way. As what for the optics and paintings itself, they will be rotated back into the American and European collections in the coming months. But why? an Art of Japan gallery? And that is a multi-part answer. The first part was we found that we had an enthusiastic audience. The ball started rolling in 2018 with Churi Obata, an American model. He's an American artist who initially was born and trained in Japan before coming to America. But he does have connections back to Japanese art because in 1928, he returned with his family for his father's funeral. And there he took an opportunity to collaborate with over 40 Japanese woodblock carvers and printers to create woodblock prints of, view, of watercolors he did in and around Yosemite on his trip there in 1927. Before COVID uh, prematurely closed the museum and the galleries, Seven Masters, the Turing Exhibition from Minneapolis Institute of Arts, and Beyond the Divide, Merchant, Artist, and Samurai in Edo, Japan, were drawing in phenomenal numbers. And even after we closed, the virtual programming where I gave a tour of, the gal of both galleries, as well as online events, including streaming of the film Miss Hokusai, had drawn incredible numbers of people logging on to see these. So we knew that there was this audience here and we wanted to keep them engaged. But just as important is our Japanese collection is growing. Over the collections I oversee at the museum, the fastest growing is the Japanese collection, particularly the works on paper. Uh, beyond the purchases of the works by Hokusai and the Wakazashi in 2018 for Beyond the Divide, we've been receiving in very generous gifts, uh, including a set of woodblock prints from Sheila Van Frank in honor of her husband, Roger Van Frank, as well as just last month, uh, Bill Traeger, who had given us, who had loaned us and given us the Samurai Armor back in 2002, uh, had loaned us for the uh, Beyond the Divide 
a screen that showed scenes from the tale of Heike. It is now turned into a gift by Bill Traeger, and I cannot ever thank him enough for his generosity. But it's not just the Japanese collections growing now, it's growing in the future. Promised bequests and offers of woodblock prints from Richilagus, Tetchment, as well as potential donors in Salt Lake City and Utah, give this opportunity to have a wonderful collection. And it would be a shame if we didn't have a gallery to show it off. Uh, one point of interest, uh, trivia fact, when I started the museum in 2001, we had 83 woodblock prints. I'm thinking by 2030, we could probably end up with near a thousand. So that is phenomenal growth. But how? How can we do a Japanese gallery in the age of COVID? Uh, and uh, usually where there's a lot of timelines built in. When we closed the museum for renovation, that period was allowed us to really renovate and change galleries and program and start to install. I officially proposed this gallery in January 2021, although I had been kind of campaigning for it since February 2020 and had some help too. Uh, when after Andreas Marx gave his uh, talk at about Seven Masters, we had took we took him out to dinner, and he told Gretchen that Luke should really have a Japanese gallery. So I need to thank him, which is very generous of him. Andreas Marx is curator at Minneapolis Institute of Art and oversees 17 galleries of Japanese art. So one is very, you know, one will be enough for me. But we are able to do a quick turnaround from January 2021 to May 26 is because we have the casework ready. Uh, instead of having to fabricate it, design it, it is ready to go. And it is also a great reuse of our resources. Instead of having to junk them, we're now saving them and reusing them. But more importantly, as just as we had the casework ready, necessary conservation of all the objects had been carried out, including on the samurai armor. I'm showing you a picture of the samurai armor when we initially installed it back in 2002. When it was on display during that time, however, the way it had been mounted had caused significant strain and uh, tear on the interior fabric, on the silk, on the leather, on the hemp. And so in order for this armor to be exhibitable, we had to first conserve it. This is a poster that the collections department created for uh, the as they conserved the wood, uh, as they conserved the samurai armor. Collections nearly doesn't get enough credit for doing the phenomenal work that they do. And in the case of beyond, in the case for Beyond the Divide, they went above and beyond. It was is their work started in late September 2019 for a show that opened in February 2020. Uh, but just a few weeks before that our then conservator and objects preparator both left for new jobs, which put many of the plans for Beyond the Divide back at square one. But luckily, uh, we had uh, a new conservator, Stacy Kelly, no relation. She had been working with us already the months previous as a paper conservator working on our paintings and prints, as well as my favorite memory, uh, David Carroll, uh, our former director of collections and exhibitions. And in the past couple of years, he had been more behind the scenes because his staff was up to uh, enough levels that they could do the work. But for Beyond the Divide, David Carroll went back into the trenches. And for me, this was my favorite memory because when I've been at the mu museums for so long, I remember working with David on installations in the past. Uh, this was a super team effort, as you can see, uh, as they're sewing and making the, uh, the, on the armor to make it ready for exhibit. The gentleman you see in the background is from, is Bill Thomas. He was a prepared, he's a preparator of natural history and helped in fabricating the mount for the samurai armor. What we didn't expect, what I did not expect was in working with David Carroll, this would be his last major project before he retired in 2020. 
Um, so, but I was glad to see, you know, that one last time to work with him. So moving on, what is the gallery's theme and the gallery's color? Well, the gallery color is a shade of purple and it is inspired by the Meiji era. The Meiji era ran from 1868 to 1912 in Japan. And it was a time of rapid modernization and industrialization. An aniline purple dye, mauve, came into the country at the same time and really became popular, especially with the royalty, because, with the emperor, because it represented modernity. As you can see here on Prince Haru's glove and in the base in the background, the purple is very, is very apparent. And just to give you a little sneak peek of what the gallery looks like. I was in the museum last Thursday when they're finished painting this wall. Once again, a big credit goes to our exhibition designer, Sarah Palmer, because it's easy to choose a purple, but Sarah had the uniquely hard challenge of finding a purple, a shade of purple, that not only works great with the objects that will be on display, but also has to work with the dark cherry wood floors of the museum and complement the colors in the nearby galleries. Now the art of Japan is in a hallway that if you stand, you can see three different colors, uh, the Prussian blue of Europe, the green of Europe, as well as the light blue of South Asia. And as you can see here, this little snapshot I picked, it just looks absolutely fantastic. And the objects, when you see them in person, are just going to sparkle and shine. The theme for the gallery is adaptation and transformation. Now, if you do readings on uh, Meiji era Japan, politics, society, the arts, a lot of keywords you see is adapting, transforming, whether it be industrialization, trains or the change or transformation of Japanese society from a feudal to a more Western style one. But instead of giving you bullet points, bullet boring bullet points with like economic figures or numbers, I thought I'd let two artists show you just how much Japan had changed, not only uh, physically, but also in the arts. This is Utagara Horoshige, the Daimaru dry goods store in 1852. This was in the Nihonbashi district, which is the shopping district in Edo, Japan. And you can clearly see the representation of Japanese feudal society. At the far left, down in the bottom, is the samurai, the highest rank in society. Then you see uh, people from various other classes, merchants, artists, milling around the dry goods store outside. Flash forward 30 years, Kobayashi Kiyachika returns to this scene for his, image, for his series, Images of the New Tokyo. Edo uh, is no longer called Edo, it's now called Tokyo. But this is the same story 30 years later. And you can see the overt changes. There are no more samurai. Uh, the samurai as a class officially ended in the 1870s. You can also see technology, telegraph lines, gas lighting next to the store. Uh, but more importantly, as art changed too, Kiyachika had, was now had been exposed to Western style art movements, including photography. And what he does here in this print from 1881 is he tries to mimic a photograph in his woodblock print. One thing he also does that Hiroshige never did was that he, Kiyachika would also do a watercolor of the sketch to give to the printer so they know the colors to match. Usually in the past, Hiroshige would have had to write verbally the shades or the colors he wanted for each of his woodblock prints. If you were in the shopping district in the 1880s or 1890s, you would have noticed alongside the dry goods store, uh, new antique stores popping up all over in the district. And here is one, a hand-colored photograph of a Japanese antique dealer in the 1890s. On display are swords, armor, vases. These came from the samurai class. In the Edo period, they had received land from their lords and the shogun, which gave them subsidies, which made them not have to work 
But in Meiji, as the class is now gone, many of them were forced to sell their swords, their family heirlooms to, uh, to survive and move on. What you see here is a, two sets of armor, which were usually very easy to buy in, in Meiji Japan. Uh, most times these armor had been created for only ceremonial purposes. But sometimes you can get, come across a set in an antique store in the 1890s or uh, more modern times that has a little bit more personality. And that one is our samurai armor. Gifted to us in 2002 by Bill Traeger. Now, this shows in terms of adaptation and transformation, uh, something unique about it. As you start to look at the chess piece, you notice these unusual circular indentations. You may be scratching your head saying to yourself, where would they come from and what would cause that kind of damage in metal plate? When, I, when people usually envision samurai warfare, this is what they envision, this scenes from the tale of Heike. You think of samurai arm, samurais fighting with bows, arrows, spears, and swords. But a sword point didn't cause that circular indentations, nor did a bow or arrow. It, what caused it, what caused them, was the first change in Japanese warfare that was introduced in the 1500s. Firearms, in this case, particularly flintlock muskets. Now you're probably wondering, as you can see, there are three dents on the front and seven on the back. Now you're probably wondering, how did the Japanese get access to firearms? Well, the answer is here. Uh, this is a pair of screens, Raku Raku Jai, sites in and around Kyoto. And it shows Kyoto in the 1500s. Now you have to scan because as you're seeing the hundreds of people of Kyoto milling about, going shopping, going to temples, there is an unusual group of people in this screen. They look like they're from out of town and they are from out of town. They are Portuguese merchants. And you can see that they're in a bit of a procession. They're being led by two men carrying placards with the Christian cross. And they're on their way to visit a Lord in Kyoto. Now, how they thought to win and curry favor with the Lord in, 15, in the 1500s in Kyoto was to bring him examples of wild animals, which I'm sure today I'm glad you know, I'm sure people are glad that practice has long gone out of style. The Portuguese came to Ch Japan in the 1540s. They were in quest, they're on a quest for goods from the East, including silk from China. So they began to trade with the Japanese lords uh, to get access to these luxury goods. And they began trading small amounts of flintlock muskets, which they had with them. But the Japanese lords who took these flintlock muskets were not seeing them as novelties, as toys. They were deeply interested in them and gave them to their metal workers. And the metal workers began to reverse engineer them and then began creating their own version of the flintlock musket. A Portuguese merchant writing in the 1550s made the comment that now there are hundreds of flintlock muskets on the island of Tagamashima, which was the island that was started to produce them. Samurai lords began to train uh, samurai to load and shoot these weapons. And through the 1570s and 1580s, samurai armies increasingly uh, fielded uh, samurai units with flintlock muskets. To the end battle in the 1600s, as the Civil War finally comes to the end, the Great Battle of Segegahara, 
And as both sides were fielding units with flintlock muskets, which would ultimately see the forces of Tokugawa Iesu win the day and establish Tokugawa Iesu as the new shogun um, and ushering in the Edo period. For armor makers, they now had to do a quick adaptation. The old armor could not have absorbed flintlock musket bar balls. But they also had a double challenge. They had to create iron plates strong enough to absorb the impact, but they couldn't make the armor too cumbersome or heavy for the samurai to wear. Samurai also needed flexibility and movement so that they could swing their katana swords in battle. And were they able to adapt? And the answer is yes, um, judging by our set of armor. Our set of armor, total weight is about 40 pounds, something very most, most sam samurai could wear with ease. And as you can see from the flintlock musket balls uh, dents, that the plates could absorb the impact. Now you're probably wondering to yourself, maybe is there a chance that this set of armor actually saw combat? and a samurai was able, was in combat and, and got shot? The answer is most likely no. Um, this comes from a set of armor called shot-tested armor, because as the peaceful Edo period extended over the years, armor makers as well as, as samurai lords were quickly beginning to wonder, are, is the armor we're making, could it actually be used if war comes to us again? And so many times a lord or an armor maker would do this as a sort of quality control. Uh, the only thing I hope is that nobody had to be wearing the armor when it was shot tested, because even though the metal in with the plates absorbed the impact, I'm sure it would hurt it tremendously. But for armor makers of the Edo period, who if you can see here, could add the finest details, uh, including clan Im imagery, insignia, as well as small pieces to the metal plates. As their demand for armor is going lower and low, low, lower, what do you do? Well, if you're an armor maker trying to get notice, you become an artist. The museum's articulated raptor was created by an armor maker. Uh, animals like these first appeared in the 1700s. These intricate moving sculptures were a way for an armor maker to win the attention of a samurai lord. And then later samurai lords would have their armor makers create these sculptures to give as gifts. But nobody took notice of them really until the 1890s. But as you can see here, before going into that, just the amount of attention and detail that the armor maker had done in armor, he now does in this articulated raptor, a very incredible lifelike raptor. The hinges that he had used to create armor so that the samurai could take it on and off, he now used to create wings that could extend and retract. The armor maker spares no detail, even including detailing the, the claws on which the, hawk, the raptor is standing. The term for these intricate moving sculptures is Jiza Okomono, but it doesn't appear until 1893 at the 1893 Chicago's World Fair. The Meiji Japanese government saw this as a great opportunity to show off the art history the, and the art of Japan. This is a custom built pavilion in Chicago that was designed to mimic a Japanese, temple, Jap, a Japanese temple. In those three pavilions, you could have gone in 1893 and saw art from the 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s, as well as the work of these intricate moving sculptures. These animal sculptures could take a variety of forms. Here are just two examples um, from the school of Miyachun, an articulated dragon from 1880, and then an articulated raptor, a close cousin of our raptor.
from 1894 from the artist Ital Shinjiro. Uh, for those who are ever curious about our raptor, what would it look like for the wings to be extended? Uh, this raptor, raptor, raptor from the private collection gives us that answer. Now you're probably wondering how much you know, uh, Okamono are still available today in galleries and at auctions. How much would set, would a sculpture like this cost? Well, depending on the animal and the condition it is in, it could run anywhere from $10,000 to $50,000. But the raptor on the right, uh, because many believe that this is one of Ita Shinjiro's sculpture that was at the Chicago's World Fair, uh, commanded a much higher price. It sold at Sotheby's Hong Kong in 2018 for $872,000, an extreme price for a great work of art. I take you back to Edo um, and to show you that just things are starting to change, um, not only for armor makers, but for everyone else in uh, the feudal society of Edo period Japan. I'm showing you Nihonbashi. Uh, if I had actually, if I focused, if I zoomed out, I could show you where the Daimaru dry goods store is. Uh, a fun bit of trivia, the Daimaru store is still there in Tokyo after 300 years later, which, you know, great speaks to longevity. In Edo, besides the great merchants and stores, you also had elaborate houses created for the samurai lords who came to Edo every other year as part of the requirement of serving the shogun. You can tell who the samurai are. The samurai by law, shogunal law in the 1650s, were the only class allowed to carry the long sword, the katana, as well as the short sword, wakazashi. Uh, and you can see here, a per small group of samurai on their way either to go shopping or somewhere else within the city of Edo. For sword makers, unlike armor makers, their demand actually skyrockets. Uh, the sold culture is very popular during in Edo period Japan. But for sword makers like Masanori, he has to adapt to some new things. There are new regulations that swordsmiths have to follow. In the 1660s, the length of the katana by shogunal decree is henceforth limited to only 27 inches. Now, as you look at this sword, I would argue that this is probably one of the most labor intensive art objects that we have in the museum. Even in modern times, it would take a team of 15 people over six months, including the swordsmith, the sword polisher, a carpenter and a leather and scabbard maker to create from beginning to end a sword like this. For Masanori in the 1660s and 1670s, he has to, he now is beginning to explore the more artistic side of the sword making process. But it's also, he has to face the demands of the samurai and lords who are all thinking in the back of their mind that war is going to come. The 1500s was really almost a century of civil war in Japan. And so for samurai and the lords, even though it's been 60 years since Toga Iesu, had won the day at Sagitahara, everyone still felt that it was going to, the shoe was going to drop. There was going to be a Lord who was going to rise up and war would start again. So the swords of the 1670s and 70s, while they're a little artistic, they're still meant for war. But luckily it was a war that never came. For the samurai who bought this, if he was on guard duty or on duty in the city of Edo, he also had to pay attention to new regulations for himself as well. Because on duty, he would have to carry both a katana, a long sword, and a wakazashi, a short sword, that had the same sword fittings, which were the scabbard, the suba, the sword guard, as well as the sword handle. 
They had to be the same color, the same type. But the war never came. 200 years later in 1847, Hoyama Munogutsu is active as a swordsmith. And I would argue, and I think Munogutsu really brings out the artistic side of Japanese sword making. Uh, it is still a very intensive and very, you know, very hard art to master. There are several times in the sword making process that there could be a chance of 50% failure and the blade is ruined and the sword maker would have to start over again. But for Munogutsu in the 1800s, he is able to go to the more artistic side of sword making. Uh, and he has freedoms that his other sword makers of the past did not have. He was able to go to a, uh, learn from one sword making master, but then go to another sword making master. Usually they stayed with one sword maker. When he had gained enough knowledge to become his own swordsmith, Munogutsu also had the ability to travel throughout Japan. And this was important because this allowed him to source the best place for steel sand, tamahagane, which is the beginning material of the katana, of the steel for the swords. So he's able to go find those best sources. He's also, he's also able uh, as a swordsmith who is the swordsmith to a clan that were blood relatives of the shogun, he has unlimited access to sword collections of lords as well as samurai. And what Koyama Munogutsu does is he studies a particular era of sword making, swords made from the 1100 to 1300, the bison era of sword making. And he is able to study the blades and replicate them in his own sword making. The wavy line you see is not a trick of the eye or a trick of the screen. That is Munogutsu's unique signature, the Haman line. This is by a unique mixture of clay during the hardening process, and it separates the cutting edge from the rest of the sword. This wavy pattern is almost a unique fingerprint of Munogutsu. Um, and before you say, oh, it's just a beautiful sword, one of other Munogutsu's great specialties was in creating sharp edges. And uh, this sword, it, this Wakazashi sword, sword blade, has not probably been sharpened in 70 or 80 years, but the blade is still very sharp. Uh, I've, you know, just, you know, barely touched it. You can tell it is still very sharp. So it is a testament to Munogutsu's skill as a sword maker that a sword uh, from so long ago still has that sharp blade. Down at the bottom is the inscription. And this is where Munogutsu records his name as well as the time and era that he made the blade for. But included is a title, Bison no Suke, the master of bison style. Now this was not a self-honorific. This was one that was given to him by his fellow sword makers in the 1840s. Uh, Munogutsu is among one of the more esteemed sword makers of the 1800s. In the early 20th century, uh, the first sword appreciation societies ranked Munogutsu as probably one of the best sword makers from 1830 to the 1840s. But one thing I like about this Munogutsu blade is the date with which it was in which it was produced. Now, if you can imagine, it's the year 1847, and Munogutsu is producing this blade in the city of Edo with a population of one million. Well, roughly contemporary, you know, at the same time, 5,500 miles away, the Mormon pioneers are about to enter Salt Lake City. Uh, to give you a good contrast, uh, the Salt Lake City metropolitan area does not reach the population of 1 million until the 2010s. As for Edo, now named Tokyo, it is now 30 million people.
Um, I would be, I, it'd be bonkers to see what Salt Lake City metropolitan area would look like with 30 million people. But you're probably wondering to yourself, Koyama Munagutsu's name doesn't really is on the tip of your tongue unless you're a sword appreciator. But Munagutsu has a contemporary and you know him very well. Um, he's one of the most still, one of the most well-known Japanese artists in existence. Oh, apologies. Um, I, um, I skipped a slide or two. Munogutsu belongs to a sword making tradition nearly 1000 years old, but it was a tradition that almost had a disastrous end. Because at the end of World War II, the Japanese surrendered their swords to the US Army. In the eyes of the United States Army, the swords were just seen as classified the same way as zero, uh, as airplanes, as battleships. They were weapons of war and they're slated for destruction. Uh, but luckily, monuments men from America, including men like Lennox Tierney, as well as Japanese in Japan, were able to convince the military authorities that the sword making, the swords, were not weapons of war, but represented an artistic heritage going back thousands, going back a thousand years. And they are able to save the swords. Sword appreciation societies began to pop up and they now are still in existence and they do an important role of what is called Shinza, inspection process where someone can bring their Japanese blade and over a six to nine week rigorous process would assess its merit, its strengths, its weaknesses. This is the paper that was given for the Wakazashi blade that was uh, given in the year 2006. Uh, our, Katana also has papers from, the same, from another sword preservation society. Now back to what I was originally going to say about Koyama Munogutsu's name not being on the tip of your tongue, unless you're a sword, if you're appreciator of swords, uh, but his contemporary is rather well known. And I think you will know who I've just said, Utaga Horoshige. Um, this is a portrait uh, for his when after he died by his friend and collaborated collaborator Utagawa Kunasada in the year 1858, and this takes us to our image, uh, our first rotation in the Japanese gallery of woodblock prints, the view of the 60 odd provinces, whose format and technique would transform the way uh, the Japanese viewed the landscape format. Uh, landscape prints in Japan. For Beyond the Divide, though, we started with Hiroshige's first series, major series, the 53 stations of the Dekaido uh, in 1833. What is the Dekaido? Well, the Dekaido is 53 stations connecting Edo to Kyoto. And this is where the, uh, the lords coming to Edo would usually take this road. Uh, and these processions, which could be several hundred people long, in turn created a route that was filled with inns, hotels, restaurants, and other amenities to take care of these rather large processions. It, the safety and security of the Edo period also allowed it to become a bit of a tourist, of, uh, a uh, tourist site so that not only samurai and lords could travel it, but other people as well. And so guidebooks were created. And as you can see here, uh, Hiroshige's these two views were from the 12th and 16th stations of the Takedo Road. Hiroshige's teacher was Utagawa Toyohiro, uh, who was not a well-known artist, um, but he had designed perspective prints in small numbers. Now, where does Toyohiro get this idea for perspective, a European type of perspective versus the flat image of Japanese and Chinese painting? He gets it from another foreign influence, in this case, the Dutch. Uh, during the Edo period, the Dutch could go to the port of Yokohama, 
And Japanese artists were very intrigued by the packing paper on some of the products that the Dutch traded with the Japanese, including etchings, which showed, example here, the idea of perspective, of the illusion of depth. And Japanese artists began to adapt it into their own work, including Toya Hiro. Hiroshige has probably seen this in the studio working with Toya Hiro. But for the 53 stations of the Dokkaido, he will start to use and to adapt another form. He adapts Toya Hiro's perspective, but also he adapts the guidebooks that were written for the Dokkaido Road series. Uh, this is a page from the Dokkaido Meshosu, which is famous places along the Dokkaido. What you see here in these two prints are what Hiroshige will be known for throughout his career. His use of fog and shadow, the weather effects, but moreover, his snow scenes, which were so phenomenal, they would only be matched 100 years later by the Shinhanga artist Kawase Hasui. Uh, but what I really wanted to talk about here was that as we look at the quality of the design or the vibrancy of the color, in Edo period Japan, one of the biggest things is commercial viability. Uh, as the curator Andreas Marx talked about that in the collaboration of a woodblock print, the designer, the woodblock print carver, the printer, who is all fronted by a publisher, there's a fifth group, the buyer. You could have a great design, you could have great color, but if a Japanese person going into the bookstore sees it and doesn't buy it, it's not gonna be popular, it's not gonna sell, and sometimes could even cost the publisher his job and his, uh, his publishing company. Uh, so, what it shows here as when the 53 stations of the Taito came out, the publisher took a big risk, but it paid off. That not only uh, on this new artist Hiroshige, but also that uh, buyers would be willing to buy 53 woodblock prints. It also established Hiroshige as a competitor against the 500 pound elephant in the room, Katsushika Hokuza who in his manga and then in his 1831 series, 36 Views of Mount Fuji, really established himself as the monopoly of the landscape genre. But we go 20 years later and things have changed. Uh, what happens now in 1853 is that a publisher commissions Hiroshige for a new print series. It's going to be a gamble for this publisher in two senses. Because instead of the well-known Takeda Road or the views of Edo, he's gonna take, Hiroshige is gonna take viewers all over Japan. From the south of the Yamabushi Valley to the center of Tokyo Sumiyoshi up to the Mutsu province in Northern Japan. Some of the images that Hiroshige would design are well-known places, but others were ones that only the locals knew about so that it was not very well known. But it worked out. In 1853, Hiroshige designs the first 42 images of the 60 odd provinces and they sell phenomenal. Um, but the second gamble, 60 odd provinces, the second gamble is you're looking at it right now the vertical format. The vertical format had been used in woodblock prints, but it was more for the Kabuki theater or for to show the beauties of Edo. Landscapes always seemed to play more to the horizontal format, which allowed for panoramic images of, the Jap of Japanese cities or Japanese countryside. But once again, Hiroshige as a master designer shows just what he can do with the vertical format process. Because Hiroshige here in Mutsu province invites you on a visual journey. He starts you at the top of Mount Home, one of the highest mountains in Northern Japan. And he asks you to start slowly scrolling up. 
He also includes a site map. He, the names of the various islands and mountains that are alongside, that are in the site of Mount Tomei. This also speaks to the extraordinary ability of the carver because he is creating legible Japanese characters that are probably less than an eighth to a quarter of an inch long. So imm immaculate skill. As you gaze up, he takes you farther out, miles and miles, until finally the mountains far off in the distance. And Hiroshige plays to the guidebooks of the region saying that the best time to go to Mount Tomei is either at sunrise or sunset. And here with the bright orange sky, uh, he's showing uh, the, Mount the site at sunset. And for the vertical format, Hiroshige also realizes, well, what about a panorama? He doesn't wanna give you a panorama. Hiroshige is a great man at cropping images. He wants you to focus on particular, a particular way of how he wants you to see the scene. And he does it spectacularly. Hiroshige also takes you away from the landscape because sometimes it's not just the land that's interesting, it's the people. So with lines and a hat in midair, Hiroshige transforms the peaceful Yamabushi Valley into a day of a violent storm. And he is able to give this impression. Uh, the clouds and shadows that were, and the evening snow of Kambara, those effects are now turning here to obscure the landscape, making you focus on the human drama as they're trying to go for cover. The gorgeous thing about these designs, as, and they sold phenomenally well, which would lead Hiroshige over the next three years to do the remaining 27 images, including in 1855, the response to Hulk Size the Great Wave, the whirlpools in Awa province. And the response to the Great Wave is in the upper left, the wave of Hiroshige, showing just like Hokusai, who had passed away in 1849, Hiroshige himself can do water and waves just as well. Now, the, imagine, the great design, the great color, if you can only imagine uh, their value today. But when they were initially published, they each cost only a, about a, the same price as a bowl of noodles. For lunch, you could have a work by Hiroshige. But I want to end with a second transformation. What was gonna come, what's gonna come in 2022? A new transformation, Shinhanga, new prints. And it transforms the woodblock print genre in several ways. Number one is the audience. Uh, in Edo period, woodblock print designers were working for the Japanese audience, creating contemporary scenes of kabuki actors, of beauties, of landscapes. But in Shinhanga, the audience is now a Western one, uh, particularly the United States and Europe. And they didn't want images of contemporary Tokyo or contemporary beauties. They wanted images of nostalgia. And so publishers like Hasegawa played into that, uh, commissioning woodblock print designers to create scenes like these, these night scenes. But you can see the effect that Hiroshige had, that a landscape print could work well in the vertical format. And so you'll see these coming on display in 2022, which are spectacular to look at. With that, I close my show and to say the gallery opens May 26th and to turn it over to Hillary to see if we have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luke. Um, what a beautiful presentation. I'm so grateful that you were willing to do this for us and for all of our art lovers this evening. Um, it's exciting to see what's going to come um, very, very shortly in, in May and to get a little glimpse of um, the second rotation in 2022. We're all really, really excited. Um, we have had a few questions come in. And um, the first one is, um, what other types of Japanese art might be on display? in this gallery in the future? 
Good question. And uh, in future rotations, we can explore. We have a Japanese. We have Japanese paintings that scroll paintings that we can place on display. Also, we have ceramics. We have calligraphy. We also have small ornaments, nesuke. And so, in the future, as we can plan, we can build new casework. We can show off those other aspects of Japanese art. And um, so, very excited about that. Wonderful. That's really exciting. Um, you you showed a couple of the woodblock prints. When might we see the Hiroshige print of the Whirlpool and the French painting inspired by it uh, on display? That is a good question. I hope in the next year or two. And what's really fun is because the gallery is right next door to the gallery that looks, that challenges the academy, the French academy particularly. And so we could have this dialogue between the Japanese and French gallery where the French, the French are looking at Japanese prints one way, but to how the Japanese were looking at Hiroshige's work in the 1850s as this now undisputed master. So I'm super excited about that because, you know, usually museum galleries, they're siloed, like, you know, but I want, you know, that dialogue between the two galleries and it will be a wonderful opportunity. Nice. Are, are you, are you planning like the rotations of those two galleries to be in alignment all the time yes. like that or? Okay. All right. Yes, we would plan it so that when the French painting that was inspired by, by the print would go on display, it would be the same time the print would, uh, Hiroshige print would go on display in, uh, in the gallery. And ironically, the rotating theme gallery, which was Leslie's European the gallery that Art of Japan took over, when the gallery first opened, uh, you know, it was kind of like a dry run for the Japanese gallery because that's where the Hiroshige print was initially installed was in that European gallery. So uh, it looked, you know, the prints look good there. So, you know, hopefully to see it soon. Wonderful. Yeah, I remember um, even the uh, the video we had of printmaking, um, I think, was in that space for a little while. Yes, as well. and the printmaking, printmaking video will be part of the Art of Japan installation. The kiosk that was built for it for Beyond the Divide, which included the tools of the woodblock printmakers, will not currently be on until um, it's safe to do interactives again. And then when that happens, the screen will be replaced and the kiosk will be on, will be in the gallery. Mm, that makes sense. That makes sense. Thanks. Um, I, I have one more question. Will the prints on rotation only come from the 19th and 20th centuries or um, what else is in store for us? They will come from a multitude of eras. Um, we do have some examples from the 1700s, but I'm also super excited. Um, there are Japanese and also foreign woodblock print artists still working in the genre today. Um, and so to go into the 19th, into the 20th century, into the 21st century. So um, this is an exciting, you know, so these will be very exciting rotations because you can see how Japanese, even, Japanese artists even today adapt and transform the woodblock print genre, uh, really working with the theme of the gallery. Wonderful. That's great. Um, I don't see any more questions coming through, but for those of you who are still watching, um, feel free to email us. Um, we'll send your questions to Luke. Um, we'll try and get you some answers. Again, um, this beautiful Art of Japan gallery will open on May 26th. Um, so we hope you all can make it in and uh, be among the first to see this new space we're so excited about. Um, so I'll say at this moment, thank you again, Luke. And thank you again, all art lovers for joining us tonight and for your ongoing support. Um, we hope you had fun. We hope you learned a little something as well. Um, your involvement um, as art lovers and friends of the UMFA is so important to us and the direction of the museum overall. We couldn't do what we do without you. And as Gretchen said in her opening, we miss you so much. We're all excited for our vaccines and getting together in person soon. Um, so make sure to call us and let us know when you're coming in. And, um, you know, maybe we could get you a special tour with Luke uh, when we get some of the actual pieces up on view. Until then, have a wonderful evening. And thank you again for all you do. Have a great evening and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.